Welcome back, uh, everyone. If you've been watching these uh, brief lectures on Ephesians, I hope you've learned something about Paul and Ephesians and the church. I certainly have. So today we are beginning at chapter 5, the second half of the book, and uh, we're going to be first interested in what Paul says in the first 20 chapters. So chapter 5 is a continuation of the final paragraph of chapter 4. So in chapter 5, love is the main idea and Paul's primary concern for the Ephesians. Remember, this letter is about reconciliation. It's about people that had nothing to do with each other and hated each other coming together in unity with Christ. The reconciliation of all things. So this is just an anticipation of the fact that eventually God will reconcile the entire creation, which means to bring it back to its condition before Genesis 3 when Adam sinned. So in this chapter, agape love is the church's energy, energy source, and its critical foundation for Christian life and community. This love that Paul describes is, in fact, the love of Christ operating in the church. It's not love as the church's own construction. It is the love of Christ given to the church by God through Christ. It's a love that encourages certain behaviors that replace ungodly behaviors. So let's read Paul's text, starting at verse 1, of course. So Paul says, or writes, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But, says Paul, among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, O oh greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them, that is, the disobedience. Paul goes to the past. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the dis disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why he said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be careful, then, how you live, not as the unwise, but as the wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. 
Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we proceed uh, today, I want you to follow the text because I go. I always go in order of the text. Christ, by his love and death, this is Paul's first point, has set a pattern to be followed. Forgiveness is the central characteristic of God that is revealed by the sacrifice of his son. Therefore, the basis of Christian thought, word and deed, is the nature of God made incarnate by Christ. Self-giving or cruciform love is the pattern that the Spirit teaches or inculcates in the inner self. Essentially, the mind being renewed from within, a mind transformed by God rather than conformed to the world's values. This is a community filled with gratitude. Remember that the major theme of this letter is the unification of Jews and Gentiles as a sign that God is moving to reconcile all things. Kindness, compassion, and forgiveness are essential because they deepen relationships that already exist, while forgiveness restores relationships that are in danger of breaking. Paul urges the Ephesians to follow the pattern of Christ, and he uses the word imitate in its noun form. The Greek word in the New Testament always appears as a verb in continuous tense, suggesting a constant habit beginning or practice beginning now and going indefinitely into the future. Imitating God means living constantly in the attitude of forgiveness as an expression of gratitude for his act of forgiveness in Christ. That is verse 1. Then Paul uses the language of sacrifice to underscore the centrality of forgiveness in the Christian community. When animals were sacrificed by priests in the temple, the blood of the animal was everywhere, and it would not be a pretty sight, and certainly not one with which we would associate sweet-smelling fragrance. We would have found it grotesque. But this is exactly what Paul says about the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, that it produces for God a sweet-smelling fragrance. It was an ugly scene to men, but a sweet fragrance to God. God, says Paul, wants them to be a loving and forgiving people. And when they are, he smells a sweet fragrance. God can be pleased. Paul's discussion of forgiveness is followed by a passage in which he writes about specific categories of sin. He mentions physical sins, sins of thinking and speaking, as well as unseen sins of the mind. Sexual sins are the first to get Paul's attention, not because he was obsessed with sex, but because of the cultural norms of the day required this emphasis. The reader will understand Paul better by setting his words in the actual social and moral context of the day. And here is what Paul was up against in the ancient world. The ancient world was bathed, swamped in a culture of sensuality. So it regarded sexual morality very lightly. It was not in any sense considered a sin. It was within the social norm for men to have a mistress. Not only was the practice within the norm, it was expected. 
sexual promiscuity was a part of Greek religious practices. The great temples in Corinth, an important religious center, were staffed with hundreds of prostitutes, and their work was considered sacred because it helped finance the upkeep of the temple. There's a Greek tradition that the temple of Aphrodite was built with the proceeds, proceeds from Greek brothels. In the Greek world, homosexual sex was not considered to be immoral. Here is what Cicero, the Roman philo philosopher, said, quote, if there is anyone who thinks young men should be absolutely forbidden the love of the courtesans, he is indeed extremely severe. I could deny the principle that he states, but he is at variance with not only with the license of what our age allows, but also with the custom and concessions of our ancestors. When indeed was this not done? When did anyone find fault with it? When was such permission denied? When was it that that, that which is now lawful was not lawful? This was the world that the Ephesians knew, and this was the world that they were being called from. Their conversion to Christ brought with it a radically new sexual standard for Greeks in particular. The cultural norms of the day encouraged sin, but the Ephesians were now part of the new humanity. So Paul needed to teach them what this meant on an ethical or behavioral uh, level. Conversion alone does not bring moral knowledge or perfection without, guess what, teaching. Paul uses two Greek words, pornia and akatharsaria, impurity, the first one being fornication. The first word refers to sex outside of marriage, and the second to acts that are unclean. Paul has introduced them to a brand new ethical ethic that runs counter to the culture in which they live, and he insists that their obedience to it is non-negotiable, a non-negotiable aspect of their new humanity. Greed is a mental sin that Paul associates with sexual morality because it too is a form of self-gratification. Neither is a part of God's humanity, neither one of these. Therefore, they are not desirable. Speech, according to Paul, is something also that needs refining. The gospel forbid, forbids talk that is obscene, foolish, and coarse. Perhaps Paul saw these kinds of con conversation as producing temptation or diminishing life in some way. Rather than this kind of talk, they are better, says Paul, to use their voices to express, guess what, thanksgiving, gratitude. That is verse 4. Paul, like James, knew that the tongue can do great damage despite its small size, just as small rudder can turn a mighty ship. The next verse must be read carefully so as not to produce a form of Christianity in which believers live in constant fear of the judgment of God. That is important. The apostle is not saying that the presence of a single immoral thought, word, or deed cancels membership in the kingdom of God. If that were the case, heaven would surely be empty of all but Jesus. Christians, through their weakness, let's face it, fall into sin, and when they do, God is ready to forgive when they repent. In this passage, Paul is talking about individuals whose lives are defined by continual acts of sin, the tyranny of sin. They have no desire to repent, 
and the consciences are tacitly cooperative. That is verse 5. The next two verses, 6 and 7, contain a warning. Paul recognized the possibility that words can be powerful even when they are empty. He may be thinking of those who taught that the soul and the body have no relationship so that sin, a sinful physical act is incapable of affecting the soul. In any case, he wants the Ephesians to heed his advice. Do not be partners with them. Now in verse 7, he uses a very long Greek word, which I will not attempt to pronounce. And it carries the meaning of close, continual, and influential relationships. Importantly, Paul is not suggesting that Christians cloister themselves as a means of avoiding sin. Excuse me. He is simply telling them to stay away from close relationships that encourage wrongdoing. Choose your most intimate friends wisely, in other words. This warning requires common sense for its application. Paul cannot be telling us to avoid all friendships with people who do not share our faith. Many of my best friends are non-Christians. The next paragraph features the image of light and darkness. Remarkably, Paul does, does say that they are, sorry, Paul does say that they are, they were once in darkness, but now they are in the light. He says that they were once in darkness, but now they are the light of the Lord. If Paul had used the preposition, preposition in before the word darkness and light, he would have been referring only to a change in their environment. But the change has occurred in them is much more substantial. A change in one's environment may or may not indicate an internal realignment. So Paul makes it clear that their lives have been renewed from within by God's inner light. We call that sanctification. Once their lives, in verse 8 and 9, were characterized by darkness, but now it is characterized by light. This is not a statement of Christian perfection. This is a statement that their life has lots more light than darkness. He encourages them to express their new inner life with acts of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Because their inward renewal demands the expression of a new moral standard. Verse 8 and 9. Now 10 to 14. Because they are light, the Ephesians are called to do more than simply put a distance between themselves and fruitless deeds of darkness. Avoiding fruitless acts is a discipline required by their new life, but more importantly, Paul calls them to live in a manner that exposes darkness and turns darkness into light. The discovery of what please, pleases the Lord will be their reward. Now, we're doing the last half of verse 14 now. Paul summarizes his message with an unidentified quotation probably taken or maybe taken from a Christian hymn that is based on the language of Isaiah 60. If this is the case, then the words refer to their baptism whereby they have come to new life in Christ and are now able to live as light because the light of Christ shines continually in them. Their light is not their light. It is the light of Christ reflected in them. Paul continues to admonish the Ephesians to live exemplary lives. He knows that since they are an infinitesimal minority living within a large pagan culture, they will experience massive pressures of conformity, just like us. And we must learn to push back, by the way. Their minority status and way of living is 
They also call them to be noticed by the wider society. In this situation, care and wisdom is their basic requirement because the days are evil. Paul wants them to make the most out of every opportunity, but leave the results to Christ. They sow the seed. They do not grow it. In my opinion, the church is not a very powerful voice in society because we don't say anything. We're silent. Our silence is guilt. Is guilt. That's not everybody, but that's what I see in the church. We are guilty in our science, driven by our thin understanding of the gospel truth, perhaps. Paul wants them to realize that the scrutiny they receive when they witness will be an opportunity to advance the truth of the gospel. But if they are careless or unwise, the gospel will be jeopardized. Therefore, knowledge of God's will informs all their actions rather than foolishness. Here, Paul is most likely referring to what we might call God's general will manifest in Christ concerning their man of, manner of living in a world that is not yet reconciled to God. That is verse 17. And continuing with verse 17, the apostle's admonishment to avoid foolishness leads naturally to the next topic he discusses. The examples he provides demonstrate the substance of wisdom and knowledgeable living. Paul contrasts being filled with the Spirit with drunkenness. If they choose to be filled with wine, then that is what will inform their behavior. They will be out of control. On the other hand, being filled with the Spirit, to continue the metaphor, will result in exactly the opposite. Their behavior will be wise and knowledge-filled. The contrast Paul has given draws the reader to the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 when the disciples were so filled with the Spirit of God that many thought the disciples were drunk with new, line, new wine. In fact, they were possessed of the Spirit. Most observers, however, at Pentecost were amazed when they heard the message of Jesus preached in their own language. So powerful and in control was Peter that he preached powerfully. The crowd was cut to the heart, and they asked Peter, what shall we do? The result, 3,000 were baptized in Acts 2.41. Then, for the church, normal life was suspended for a time as they sought out the apostles' teaching and entered into fellowship with fellow believers by breaking bread and praying together. Many miracles followed and their fellowship became so intimate that many sold their goods and shared their proceeds. What wine could never do, the Spirit did. Verse 18. Now Paul mentions four, four effects of the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit produces, one, a desire for corporate, joyful worship. The desire to praise God is the second result but common sense tells us that we are not to read Paul too literally when he writes everything. He really means every good thing, I think. In worship, we praise God for his act of saving us and empowering us with his spirit. Worship leads to reverence for Christ, and reverence for him compels the worshiper to submit to others. The church needs to remember that mutual submission is the glue that binds the church into one body, and it is the characteristic of all godly human relationships. And in our next lecture, we'll bear down on this word, submit. Mm -hmm.